A spectre hangs over modern physics, the tension between our three-dimensional world and the elusive concept of emergent space-time. But what does that even mean? It's not easy to answer or even to picture in your mind. That's the challenge this video takes on. A brain is what most people imagine when we talk about space-time, and it is somewhat easier to imagine, like a plane floating in higher dimensional space. Emergent space-time, though, demands a different kind of leap. It asks us to picture something our minds aren't wired for, like asking a fish to imagine walking on dry land. Still, if we approach it carefully, we can glimpse how the vast universe might unfold from something impossibly small. The problem comes in two parts. Dualities. There are infinitely many ways space-time could emerge, and no obvious way to know which, if any, is correct. Many phenomena might have multiple answers, all equally valid. We, however, will attempt to go over a few of the simple versions and explain how they might solve physics' most significant questions, a proof of concept to demonstrate its feasibility and not its truthfulness. Imagination. Our minds weren't built to see emergent space. We'll need metaphors, not mechanics, to bridge that gap. We will use a tiny amount of space to help you make that conceptual leap. Just take a mental note that no space is needed. So let's be clear, what follows is not the answer. These are scaffolds for intuition, sketches of how emergent space-time might work so that you can use them to understand some of the more eclectic physics theories out there. The aim is to guide you to that when you see it moment. Our tool will be a thought experiment. Imagine a cube, only one Planck unit across. From this impossibly small box, the universe is projected onto a vast screen, much like Leonard Susskind's holographic principle, hence the box's name. Then we mix with Plato's analogy, known as the allegory of the cave. Picture the singularity of a black hole projecting the entire universe's history onto its event horizon. That we are using a Planck unit doesn't matter. It's simply a way to imagine how something infinite could emerge from something infinitesimal. This visualization will guide us through the rest of the video as we explore how different versions of emergent space-time might account for key physics phenomena and how this perspective stacks up and is similar to interpretations like Copenhagen or many worlds. Not a map of reality. Emergent space-time may take infinitely many forms, so the chances we got this right the first time are low. What you see here are illustrations, not answers. The box is a tool for intuition. The design aims to get you to the point where you say, when you see it. Dualities, not mechanisms. The box is a tool for intuition and introduction. The design is to get you to the point of when you see that emergent space is possible and one could create alternate answers to the same phenomena. Borrowed inspiration. This video aims not to be overly original, but to provide a straightforward visualization that connects the various theories. Building on Leonard Susskind's holographic principle, which combines Plato's analogy, known as the allegory of the cave, to explain how our brains could be creating space-time. There are several more theories included in here, but for the sake of brevity, they are left out. The aim isn't proof, but perspective using known analogies. What's inside the box? Picture it as a cube with an arbitrarily large number of dimensions. Then place spheres to see how we can create the illusion of space. We'll climb one dimension at a time to see how contact and therefore interaction changes. Line, 1D, only two points can touch. Square, 2D, three circles can all touch one another. Cube, 3D, four spheres form a tetrahedron, each tangent to the rest. Tesseract, 4D, five spheres can all be mutually tangent, impossible in 3D, but achievable with an extra dimension. As we add more dimensions, we can add more spheres while keeping them mutually touching every other sphere. That matters because everything touching everything means any sphere can interact with, or be entangled with, any other at any time. Meanwhile, the interior room, or surface area, grows exponentially. The curse of dimensionality, if you will. In principle, you could pack in as many spheres as there are particles in the observable universe, with every pair still separated by less than a single Planck unit, just by adding dimensions. Now let us play a game of Pong, the size of the observable universe. Picture a million multi-dimensional spheres packed inside the box. 
put a tiny point on each one, set them spinning, and when one of the points collides with another, they bounce off like the game of Pong. Now, shine a light through the box and project the result onto a screen. What you'd see is millions of dots drifting across an enormous canvas, bouncing into one another as if spread across vast distances. But inside the box, those points are never more than a single Planck unit apart. The apparent movement away from or to each other is just an artifact of the projection, an illusion, much like space-time itself. The whole time, not one point is ever more than one Planck unit away from any other point. Think about the Minkowski diagram in special relativity. At first glance, it looks like nothing more than a flat, abstract grid of space-time events. But beneath it lies something more profound. There is no actual distance between points, only the time it takes for one event to influence another. In this view, distance is simply a translation of interaction time, a construct born from how long it takes for interactions to occur. Now carry that idea over to the box, where every sphere with a marked point touches every other sphere. Once the box is projected, it becomes clear that particles which appear far apart may actually be directly connected or even entangled. The Planck-sized projector is our metaphor. The screen as a type of the Minkowski diagram, a way to picture how the infinite might emerge from the infinitesimal. This visualization will stay with us as we test different versions of emergent space-time, asking whether they can explain key physics phenomena and how they compare to interpretations like Copenhagen or many worlds. In the familiar Cartesian system, we have three axes, X, Y, and Z. But each time we add a new dimension, a sphere gains another axis of rotation. With enough axes, the surface of a higher dimensional sphere becomes so vast that no single point can ever sweep across and touch all the others. Now imagine a universe built this way. Each point, or particle, rotates fully along X, Y and Z, but also wobbles ever so slightly on an extra axis, call it M. This subtle wobble makes interactions unpredictable. Sometimes two points align and meet, sometimes they pass by without ever touching. That picture captures two familiar features of quantum physics. Probability, where outcomes can't be pinned down in advance, and quantum tunneling, where particles occasionally slip past barriers they shouldn't. Seen this way, the overlap with the Copenhagen interpretation becomes clear. But we can push the metaphor further. Suppose some points rotate more strongly on the M-axis than the standard three. They would appear and disappear rapidly in our Cartesian frame, much like virtual particles. Or imagine points that exist just outside the standard axis altogether. They wouldn't interact with the usual particles, but they would add to the total count in a given region, an echo of dark matter. This is why so many physicists suspect that our three-dimensional picture of the universe might not be fundamental at all, but rather a construct of how we process information. But wait, there is even more to this box. Let's adjust the parameters and see what type of mechanics we get. A few things are happening in what you wrote that we can clarify and tighten. Why the higher dimensional Cartesian frame matters. We need that scaffolding so we can describe the box rotating in ways not possible in 3D. This gives us directions of change that aren't spatial which makes it a good metaphor for time. The role of rotation. In ordinary physics, we'd imagine particles or fields evolving. Here, the particles don't move. The box itself rotates in higher dimensional space. That rotation becomes the ordering principle we call time. Sequences versus motion. Since the box can turn on many axes, each orientation is almost identical but slightly shifted. The succession of orientations is what we perceive as events happening in sequence. Continuity of time. If there are millions of such faces, the differences between orientations are vanishingly slight, giving us a smooth progression, what feels like continuous time. You can picture this with a simple analogy. Place three balls inside a glass cube. Now rotate the cube. The balls stay where they are, yet their positions appear to shift as your frame of reference changes. Now, add many more dimensions and balls, and you can see a type of stop-action movie. This ties directly to Einstein's famous remark. For those of us who believe in physics, the distinction between past, present and future is only a stubbornly persistent illusion. In relativity, simultaneity is relative. There is no universal now. The linear flow of past, 
present future is, scientifically speaking, an illusion caused by the changing frame of reference of the observer. To make sense of this, return to the Minkowski diagram. The line we interpret as distance is actually our frame of reference relative to the box, with each point serving as a reference point. The universe then resembles a stop-motion film. As the box rotates, the points only seem to move. Our perspective stitches those frames together into what we call time. How long is each turn of the box? A Planck time. See how neatly that fits into relativity and quantum mechanics. Explaining time dilation within our usual framework of three spatial dimensions plus time often feels counterintuitive. Take the classic twin paradox. Why does one twin age more slowly than the other? Without advanced math, it's hard to picture, but we can use a more straightforward analogy. The great circle on a Mercator projection. On a globe, great circles represent the shortest distance between two points. Yet on a flat Mercator map, those same paths look curved while the straight lines we draw are actually rum lines, paths of constant compass bearing. Here's why. Spherical versus flat world. Earth is a three-dimensional sphere, but the Mercator map is only two-dimensional. Mercator distortion. The Mercator projection preserves angles and shapes locally, but it wildly distorts distance as you move toward the poles. In fact, the poles themselves stretch infinitely and cannot be displayed. This distortion reflects the gap between your own frame of reference and the many possible paths around the box. From our perspective, the twin who accelerates into space traces a curved path. But for the travelling twin, that alternate route amounts to a shorter distance in time. In other words, increasing momentum acts like taking a shortcut, though our view of space-time is so warped that we don't perceive it that way. I am told that the math is very similar to the visualisation, I haven't yet worked out how time dilation plays out under gravity within this framework, which leaves several possibilities open. That means I don't yet have a complete solution to relativity in emergent spacetime. Still, the parallels we can already observe suggest that emergent spacetime is a plausible path forward. Pinning down its probability would require much deeper study, but at least we now have a conceptual framework to build on. Leonard's box is a thought experiment designed to make the nearly unimaginable idea of emergent space-time easier to picture. By projecting the universe from a tiny cube just one Planck unit wide, the model shows how space, distance, entanglement, probability, and even time might emerge from higher dimensional geometry. Inside the box, nothing is ever more than a Planck unit apart. Yet when projected outward, we perceive vast distances, shifting particles, and the illusion of continuous time. While not a literal description of reality, Leonard's box offers a scaffold for intuition. It connects ideas from relativity, quantum mechanics, and holography into a simple metaphor, helping us imagine how the infinite might arise from the infinitesimal. At its core, the box is a reminder that the space-time we experience may not be fundamental at all, but an emergent construct shaped by deeper, hidden dimensions.